Hi, this is Paul. I finally have time to start digging into the gift that uh, David Fuller gave me with his interview with Jordan Peterson and the Kingdom of God quote. Peterson starts out by saying, well, I wasn't listening and I could have fallen from my chair when he said that. I was like, not listening? I've listened to this guy for I can't tell you how many hours over the last year, but at the same time, I one of the things as I learn as an avid listener is how poor of a listener I am. The more I listen, the more carefully I listen, the more I realize how much I miss. So going over some things, and, and in fact, I just got an email this morning where someone brings up exactly what I put in my put in this video so let's let's take a let's take a listen at what I missed got a couple of minutes left so this might be quite a big question but just come back from the US where we interviewed Paul Vanderclay a Christian pastor who's been doing quite a lot of um, videos about your your thought he one of his questions was he says he, he sees a real sort of stoicism in your thought to pick up your cross and drag it up the hill. His question is... But before, I, before we get to the question, I'm sure some of you have heard this multiple times, as I have. One of, the, one of the interesting things that I've noticed, if you look at my conversation with Job, um, it's entitled The Book of Job on my channel. And Job mentioned his... Um, he grew up in a, in a Dutch Reformed context and stopped going to church um, and nobody job tells his story incredibly well that was one of my favorite conversations that i've done and then he 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 became an atheist and then the nihilism you know really began to bother him so then he explored buddhism and then he explored stoicism and when he said that i thought my goodness uh, stoicism stoicism as a for lack of a better word, as a living faith today really took me by surprise. But then I'm, I'm following Robert Wright's two channels, Meaning of Life TV and BloggingHeads.TV. I, I got to him via watching uh, McWhorter and, and Glenn Lowry and, and been listen to him, listening to a lot of Robert Wright lately, and I noticed that Robert Wright has this interview with a, another university professor who has, in some ways, in some ways, resurrected Stoicism as a living faith. Now, these faiths are secularized. One of the, one of the things that you immediately notice with with Buddhism, at least as a religious person. With, with Buddhism in the West is how secularized it is. And Andrew Sweeney and I talked about that in the conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago. And Stoicism, Stoicism, classical Stoicism already had a leaning towards secularity as I think Buddhism does, which, which in a sense makes them much more ready at hand towards the kind of appropriation, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, the kind of appropriation that we see happening as secularism, as we continue in this secular process. And, and that's actually what I'm going to be doing quite a bit of talking about in this video, because in some ways, Peterson is a Christian analog to the secularist Buddhist and the secularist Stoic, the contemporary secularist Buddhist and the contemporary secularist Stoic. And one of the things that I noticed with, with Peterson was this, as was this alignment with some of the reformed emphasis on total depravity. My conversation with Sid Helema that came out in that conversation and and I immediately noticed it at first. Our cultural our cultural habit tends to be a triumphalism, where we imagine that through and this comes through very clearly with Sam Harris, where we imagine we can with reason and science achieve anything and everything. What that approach tends to 
turn, let's use willful blindness, tends to turn a willfully blind eye towards is the human factor. Let's let's concede for a moment, and I'm not a I'm not a climate change skeptic personally, and I know some of you will react to that in the comments, which is fine. Make your case. I'm not a climate change skeptic, but what I am is a skeptic. I'm a political skeptic. What do I mean by that? I am skeptical about what we can accomplish in terms of working together as a people. I'm not skeptical in terms of what science can achieve. Science achieves what science achieves. It's mechanistic. It's once you take the subjective out you can create hydrogen and oxygen from water predictably. What I am far more skeptical about are what people will do with science because the human heart is deceptive. And I think one of the, one of the greatest, uh, Tolkien is, is having his way with our culture when when you listen to Galadriel, even comes into the movies of the Lord of the Rings, even through the book, the book is better, of course, but comes in through the movies that the hearts of men, what do we do when we get the ring? Well, we are, we are in that sense, children of Sauron. And a little bit later in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Jonathan Peugeot's monotheism part two talk where he is trying to translate new testament language into contemporary speech and he has to make a second video because i imagine and could fully imagine that a lot of people got lost in the first one so so why is jordan peterson similar to a stoic well, am I being faithful to classical sto Stoicism or the contemporary manifestation of secular Stoicism in that? Probably not. But there is a, when I listen to, actually, when I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson and many of others have had this experience, when I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson, I hear my mother. Well, what, what do you mean I, I hear my mother? Well, my mother was a, um, she was a children of Frisians. She was a children of poor Frisians who all they did was struggle uphill. And one of the things I remember quite clearly growing up was you'd get the message in the, the Frisian, it's not really a Dutch community, it's a Frisian community because the Frisians are a separate group from the Dutch. And if you go to a place like Whitensville, Massachusetts, uh, there are many Frisians there and their culture persists. One of the, if, if you had to put something on the wall, which you would never put on the wall in an American culture because it wouldn't look good, the, the, the saying would be, no one wants to hear you complain. Now, as now I'm years past listening to this message, I think about the stoicism within the Frisian reformed community that for generations had suffered hunger and poverty and you work from the time you get up in the morning every day is struggling uphill yet you would imagine that if the contemporary if if the contemporary critique of religion were applied to them it, it clearly gets them all wrong because their their religion was just as dour as their as, as their lives were. The religion was by no means escapist, except that what, what happens is that the darker you see the world, the more illuminating grace is. Now, this is, this is where I'm, I'm burying the lead because I will play through the Peterson thing, but this is, this is where the conversation gets very interesting with Peterson's answer on the city on the hill. But I, I wanted to explain the stoicism comment a little bit more and flesh it out a little bit more. That that wasn't that wasn't really a critique. I, I understand that hearing a Christian minister critique in this culture will inevitably sound like base tribalism speaking. And we're going to talk about that when we listen to the Billy Graham thing. Oh, the, the longer I talk, the longer I know this will be a long video. And of course, you truck drivers out there won't mind. But the stoicism is, is, is not so much 
a reflection on classical sto Stoicism or its contemporary rejuvenation, but this, this more simplistic common association between Stoicism and, let's say, a stiff upper lip. So let's, let's listen to Peterson's answer. What's at the top of the hill? He doesn't City hear that. Well, that's because he hasn't listened to the times when I've been talking about it, I guess, because I've mm. said it repeatedly. Mm. You uh, I have been listening, but I haven't heard. And, and so I will, I will take maximal responsibility for me not hearing, because when I go back and I listen to things that I've heard many times, I say, oh, yeah, he did play it. So let's, let's keep going. Stumble uphill with your burden towards the city of God. That's the, that's the story. What does that mean, the city of God? to you. Ah, so now David, okay, let's, 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 now, now Peterson has to become a preacher. Well, why, what do preachers do? No, people, again, just as my colloquial association of stoicism with stiff upper lip, preaching has a colloquial association with admonition and scourges. What, what preachers, and in a sense prophets, usually major in is explanation and contextualization. How can I take this term, which in this case, city of God, how can I make this understandable to people in this time and place? And again, if you listen to Jonathan Peugeot's God as Santa Claus monotheism videos, part one and part two, this is what poor Jonathan is trying, and I've, I'm terrifically sympathetic to him because I know just how hard this is. And so Peterson gives the Peterson gives the let's say the repetitive answer, or the rote answer, or the dogmatic answer of City of God. Okay, Jordan. Now explain this to people in 2018 in language that they can associate with and apply, well, that's the challenge. I would say that that's... That he also does look tired here. That's a place where everyone bears maximal responsibility and speaks the truth. Now, it's important a uh, 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 proof text without a context is a pretext for sliding in your own agenda here. And so I've got to be careful here because this comes at the end of a 30, at least a 30 minute interview with David and knowing how Peterson stacks up his schedule, the guy is the definition of a workaholic. I mean, he works flat out. This is exactly what he says he does. And so this could come at the end of the day. Um, no, no offense to, with all due respect to David, he's and David will probably acknowledge this. He's uh, the the likes of David, even with his twenty three thousand subs, is a um, is not too high on the on the hierarchy yet. So David is probably getting an, an end of the day interview here. I may be wrong, and and go ahead and correct me if I'm if I am wrong. But Peterson does look tired here, and this is one of the hardest answers he has to give. So, but, but also back to the context piece, if you listen to the whole interview and then listen to this answer, all of us speak from within context. And so you have to, you do have to answer, understand this answer within this context. Well, let's let it play. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And what's the responsibility? You're responsible for the suffering in the world. You're responsible for the malevolence in the world. And you're responsible for the veracity of your utterances now now this is this is opposite of so much of what he's trying to fight and it's opposite of the wave that he's been seeing and this is a reason that conservative religious people are especially conservative religious Christians are flocking to him now a number of you have sent me the desiring God podcast on Peterson and there was recently one 
from Whitehorse Inn. Now, most of you probably don't know what I'm talking about with respect to Desiring God. That's John Piper's outfit. Whitehorse Inn is 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 Michael Michael Horton's outfit. These are very conservative, reformed Christians, and 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 they are not. They're they're more conservative than my, than I am on with some of with some of the the postmarks that are used to identify the colloquial right and left in the reformed community but but uh, again for for a university of toronto psychology professor who is basing his justification of biblical authority upon darwin the the interest and enthusiasm with which this community or let's not say enthusiasm let's say there's there's a degree of caution always but they're not railing at him in the way that they might let's say rail at someone like me in the Christian Reformed Church that does things like ordain women as elders and pastors their treatment of him is noteworthy and important and telling because what he is doing with this responsibility kick, and we heard this through David Fuller's interview with the Zen master, is we are responsible for the evil of the world. Now, if you, if you take this and compare it with what's going on in terms of the culture war, in terms of the identitarian critique the the facile use of patriarchy or white supremacy in our cultural conversations again if you listen to the Zen master conversation with with David Fuller that I listened to yesterday and and you and you hear Jordan Peterson's commentary of how you should feel when you, visit a Holocaust museum or Auschwitz Peterson's Peterson's critique is when you go into this place you should in fact appropriate the guilt and not appropriate a a self-serving historical bias that says this is everyone else's fault now David Fuller I think I'm, I'm with David Fuller on on the critique of Peterson in that when he really gets railing against social justice warriors he in a sense betrays some of this own position where if you can if you can go to if you can go to Auschwitz and say I did this if you can historically appropriate it to what degree don't we also need to say when we look at the the rise of let's let's call it neo marxism in our contemporary critique to what degree am i responsible for that that that, that gets it, it's always more difficult on your heart to take responsibility for your contemporary en enemy than to take responsibility for past sins and, and and this this just shows the complexity of it because peterson could could justifiably say well i'm not responsible for the left's hijacking of the university and giving up on the project of ed of training our children with a classical education, having them read Plato, having them read Aristotle, having them learn Latin, having them understand their own history. And see, right away we're getting to questions of identity and community and tribe. So, so this is very difficult. But, but what he does here is, what he does here is say here on the city on the hill what we're dragging the cross up this is a this is a path of mortification which is a term that you would be that medieval that, that christians would be using throughout their history now now remember what a religion is 
now I'm not I'm not redef, redefining Peterson's definition of religious, but what a religion is, a religion is an intentional long conversation maintaining a canon, a dogma, so that we can in fact converse with people productively over thousands of years. This this is how we in fact keep community with our ancestors. To put on a little Jonathan Peugeot hat, this is how we in fact maintain the cloud of witnesses and maintain the communion of the saints by being able to converse with our church fathers. Now, now Americans are particularly bad with this because Americans want to live in the moment and Americans are, even even Christian ones, are have a, have a deep belief in our secret, sacred self. But, but this is what religion does. Religion has us conversing with, with Augustine and John Calvin and, and, and Chrysostom. And, see now, now, of course, Jonathan Pichot would go into the Eastern Fathers, which, regrettably, I know far too little of Origen, Tertullian, Irenaeus, so on and so forth. So... This, this is what we're doing now. Peterson is saying, okay, we're, we're pulling our cross up the hill. Right. And in the city of God, you're maximally responsible for the suffering. You're maximally responsible for the malevolence. And you speak the truth. That's what it is. Now we're going to get into this, and we're going to revisit this a number of times, because... For all of the care that Peterson uses about his words, he's using some synonyms here, which are not bad synonyms. He's using city of God and, in fact, kingdom of God. And to show what a bad listener I am, just yesterday it was pointed out that multiple times in the video when I talked about Peter Kreef's book, which is Between Heaven and Hell, I said Between Heaven and Earth. Now, my watchers inside my head and... Um, the commenter, commenter said, well, it's a Freudian slip, and I think he's very much right, because if I were to sit down with Peter Kreeft, the, the title of this book, which he may or may not be responsible for, given what editors do and what publishing houses do, the difference between heaven and hell and heaven and earth is a very important difference, especially in the context of that little dialogue that Peter Kreeft does. But these, these Freudian slips, these synonyms, the kingdom of, uh, city of God, kingdom of God, city on a hill, that's of course, I used that in a previous video. This is of course John Winthrop's sermon, a, a Puritan minister that, that gets into the American mythology about what America is. We are a city on a hill. And, and this is very much going to get into the question of Western civilization and Christendom and, and whether it's actually over in terms of the Christianity that formed Jordan Peterson, even as a young boy growing up into in the mainline um, Canadian church. Now let's... So let's let's dive in. Yeah, all this is introduction. It's really bad preachers have too long introductions. The city on the hill. Okay. Now maps of meaning. So so right away after I made that that video, someone does a quick search of maps of meaning and comes up with two references to the city of God. And see even I even get the I even get the quote wrong in my PowerPoint. This comes after this diagram that if you've watched Maps of Meaning and if you've read the book is 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 important for Peterson and actually Peterson calls this three questions so I'll just read the quote our answers to these three fundamental questions and these are the three questions our answers to these three fundamental questions what is what should be and how should we act now that what is question a little bit later I'm going to go to a response video done to my conversation between me and Andrew Sweeney on node in the node in the node in the network where we're going to get into Northrop Fry and what is, because Northrop Fry says, and Northrop Fry is, is quoted extensively in the notes to Maps of Meaning, 
Once you ask that question, what is, you fundamentally, what is God? You fundamentally change the assumption of, you fundamentally change God in your imaginary. Okay, now when I say, every time I say in your imaginary, I am appropriating language from Charles Taylor, which may or may not be helpful to you because how many of you could actually read that huge book? What is, what should be, how should we act? Modified and constructed in the course of our social interactions constitutes our knowledge. Mm, that's really framed, especially after you listen to Northrop Fry on this. Constitutes our knowledge insofar as it has any behavioral relevance. Constitutes our knowledge from the, mytholo from the mythological perspective. See, so this is why I've got some con questions with our node in, the node in the network guy in terms of how self-consciously and strictly is Peterson appropriating Northrop Fry in this? I don't know. Bear in mind, Peterson also wrote this 15, 20 years ago, so or 30 years ago, because it took 15 years to write that book. The structure of the mythic known, what is, what should be, how it can get from one to the other, is presented in figure one. That's this figure. The domain and constituent elements of the known. The known is explored territory, a place of stability and familiarity, is the city of God as profanely realized. So now think about his conversation with um, McGilquist, and I still yet have to read McGilquist's book. It isn't an audio book yet. I hope it does come because I can just get through books quicker that way because I can listen to them while I drive and wash dishes and do all kinds of other chores. But here City of God is identified with known territory. And again, if you're listening to Peterson a lot, you want to understand the two sides of the brain, um, explored territory and unknown territory. Here City of God, and again, Peterson talks about this often, City, the city is the known space. It finds metaphorical embodiment in myths and narrative describing the community, the kingdom, or the state. Such myths and narratives guide our ability to understand the particular bounded motivational significance of the presence, its present experienced in relation to some identifiable desired future, and allow us to construct and interpret appropriate patterns of action from which the confines of that um, from within the confines of that schema. We all produce determinate models of what is and what should be and how to transform one into the other. We produce these models by balancing our own desires as they find expression in fantasy and action with those of the other, with those of the others, individual, family, and communities that we habitually encounter. How to act constitutes the most essential aspect of the social contract. The domain of the known is therefore the territory we inhabit with all those who share our implicit and explicit traditions and beliefs. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, th this is... If you apply this paragraph to the book Maps of Meaning itself, what you might take away would be that what you act embodies... Peterson says it all the time, it's pragmatism. What you act embodies your axioms. And what he's trying to do here in Maxim Meaning is, is use contemporary, now Northrop Fry would say third phase, and again, we'll get, you'll have to listen to the node, of, the node in the network video to, to understand Northrop Fry's phases that he gets from Vico. Third phase language to describe something that first phase language, mythological language, did better. And again, this is, this is deep in terms of what Jordan Peterson is saying. Jordan Peterson is saying that the Bible articulates this stuff in better ways than this capacity of language can. That's where he says the city of God is profanely realized. Now, what does, he, what does he mean profane? Well, there's the profane and there's the sacred. Well, what is the profane? The profane is the secular. That's a synonym. And so what for Peterson is the city of God? Now, okay, Jordan, how consistently are you using this language? I'm beginning to have my doubts, but I will 
I'm full of grace. I will forgive you. I'm partly full of grace because I know how much I own mess up. And these videos are testimonies to how many times I own mess, I mess up. So that's on page 24 of Maps of Meaning. This on page 153 with a very interesting biblical quotation. The hero is narrative. The hero is narrative representation of the individual eternally willing to take creative action. Now I'm going to be preaching on Jonah this week and Jonah 1 and 2, and I am going to be contrasting Jonah with a hero. Is the book of Jonah a hero story or not? And the answer might be interesting for some of you, and if you listen to my rough draft for Sunday this week, you'll, you'll get some answers. The hero is narrative representation of the individual eternally willing to take creative action, endlessly capable of originating new behavioral patterns, eternally specialized to render harmless or possibly beneficial something previously threatening or unknown. It is declarative, it is, it is declarative representation of the pattern of behavior characteristic of the hero that eventually comes to approximate the story of the savior. Behind every particular, that is historical, adventurer, explorer, cre um, creature, revolutionary, and peacemaker, looks the image of the Son of God, another. Now, now he's, he's using Son of God, and then, then he's going to quote the quintessential Son of Man passage. Uh, now, I am a believer in a literal age to come, and I am a believer in the continuation of the ego and the person into the age to come, translated and transformed. And so perhaps what we will have in the city of God, in the kingdom of God, is that when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining of the sun, we've no, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So maybe what, one thing I will do in the age to come is Jordan Peterson and I are going to have a long conversation about this book. And Jordan Peterson will probably say, oh, now am I putting Jordan Peterson in the save tribal camp? You can twist that around in the comments section if you like. I'd have a long conversation about this book, and Peterson would probably say, yeah, I wrote it when I was young, and I was trying to translate mythological language, phase one language, into th phase three language, and it doesn't really work that well. And, yeah, I, I think I'm understanding what Peterson is doing with this book. The arch um, The archetypic or ultimate example of the Savior is the world redeemer, the Messiah. Now, again, given my training giving my training in biblical studies, I can't look at these words with innocent eyes. I can't look at these the definition of Messiah without understanding how the Gospels are the, are the record of Jesus' redefining of that word for his context, for his people. The archetypal or, or ultimate example of the Savior is the world redeemer, the Messiah, world creating and world redeeming hero, social revolutionary and great reconciliator. It is the sum total of the activity of the Messiah accumulated, excuse me, accumulated over the course of time that constitutes culture. The great father, I can see why Peterson spent, uh, spent agonized over every phrase in this book. The book itself is tortured. The great father, order itself, explored territory, the domain of the known. In the meta-stable society, however, the father, though healthy, is subordinate to the son. All fixed values necessarily remain subject to the pattern of being represented by the hero in the city of God, this time capitalized. What kind of editing did this book get, I wonder? I know it's being reformatted for Kindle, which I think will probably be a good thing. In the city of God, that is, the archetypal human kingdom, the Messiah eterni eternally rules. Okay. And then he quotes Daniel 7. Now, Daniel 7 is a tremendously important passage. Another thing that I want to do in the age to come, maybe, maybe it'll all seem dull to us by then, but, but get N.T. Wright and Jordan Peterson to sit down and talk about Daniel 7. Jordan Peterson has spent his time as a psychologist and... N.T. Wright has spent his time as a biblical theologian. 
I saw in the night the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came and came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that the people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and the kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Now pay attention to Son of Man there, not Son of God. Jesus comes, and Jesus is Son of Man and Son of God. And if you ask people today, what does Son of Man mean? They will say something like, well, that means he's the son of a human being. Son of Mary, Theotokos, as the Orthodox like to say. Yeah, I'm learning. Now, what's interesting about the Daniel 7 passage is that this is a Son of Man. And now we get into layers of interpretation because there's the the authorial content layer, the author the authorial intent layer of Daniel 7, in which Son of Man describes him as a person, but then there's the prophetic layer of Daniel 7, where Jesus then appropriates this term Son of Man, probably because it had already been appropriated, or at least the the rough draft of its appropriation was present in the culture that Jesus was engaging in Second Temple Judaism, where, where Jesus identifies himself repeatedly as the Son of Man and does so as a veiled reference to Messiah. And when people read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they say things like, well, Jesus isn't representing himself as a divine figure, I have to say, then, why on earth is he using Son of Man? And why on earth is he doing that? Understanding full well what his audience, that his audience would understand that phrase as in Daniel 7, as in that this is the man that will bring in the kingdom, that will bring in the kingdom of God, that will bring in the city of God. And this, in its multitude of layers and textures, weaves together the meaning that is in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, John uses eternal life. And Paul uses in Christ, which we will talk about a little bit later, which will be very important for understanding Jonathan Peugeot's little videos of, of trying to be the preacher. Now, this gets interesting because, okay, so this is the language that Peterson is using. All right, City of God. A little bit later, I'm going to play some from his Easter message where he uses Kingdom of God. And this, this synonym, which is a a justifiable synonym is important. So listen to Peterson talking about the tribal question about his belief in God with Margaret Hoover on Firing Line, which is PBS's attempt to not be quite so liberal. Yes, KBIE is my station. I'm going to start it at 1518. William F. Buckley, who was the original host of this show, was the prominent television personality of the modern American conservative movement and hosted the show for 33 years. One of his guests was Billy Graham. And I'd like to show you a clip from one of those appearances and then get your response. Sure. Let's like, take a look. Sure. Today we propose to focus on Christianity specifically. And the okay, now what's interesting here again is that if you go very early in my videos, one of my uh, analogies of Jordan Peterson and the Jordan Peterson phenomenon has been Billy Graham. And I have contrasted Billy Graham with Jordan Peterson partly on the question of institutions. Now, here's young William F. Buckley talking to young Billy Graham. And now 1969 is not 2018 in terms of Christendom. 1969 is the height of mainline Christianity or at least a little past the apex, perhaps, because the 60s doesn't really begin until 1965-ish. It doesn't really get rolling until 1968, 1969, and there we have the roots of the culture war. There we have the beginnings of the breakdown of the alignment of church and state in America in the Cold War configuration, where not unlike the Avengers, the United States... 
uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, whose mother was a fiercely religious woman, read David Brooks' The Road to Character and the little chapter he does on Eisenhower. His mother is a fiercely religious woman. Eisenhower is a nominal Christian, but when we have to go to Cold War with communism, we inscript God to the degree that we print him on our money and we insert him in the pledge. We draft God to fight a principality and power. And the evangelicals, or as are often called the neo-evangelicals, Billy Graham very much being one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent leaders of that movement. Now I'm presupposing a ton of church history that most of you probably don't know anything about. Sorry about that. Jordan Peterson does that to me with psychology all the time. So It's at this moment that we begin to see the separation of the neo-evangelicals not really begin, but we, we see the the current seeds of our of the religious right where the neo-evangelicals differentiate themselves from the mainliners. And this is the, the, the differentiation between God one and God two, where where Chuck Colson will have gone to church all his life in a mainline Episcopal church, but then through the influence of a number of individuals, find God and Jesus to be very real to the degree that he will appropriate the language of a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's that appropriation that Sam Harris really kvetches. And it's this appropriation that evangelicals want Jordan Peterson to do a redux of Charles Colson here. This is what the, now I always use the evangelicals and some of you who are evangelicals who embrace me, um, which is wonderful, because is Paul Vanderclay an evangelical? It depends what you mean by an evangelical. Do I believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? Yes. Do I believe in the Apostles' Creed in a very literal way? Yes. Do I expect the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yes. So in that way, I easily slide into the evangelical camp because according to the measures of evangelicalism, I qualify. But my roots are with the Dutch Reformed, and via John Calvin, we have our connection to the Church Fathers and so on and so forth. So my roots are pre-evangelical, and, and so in a sense, I take a step back from evangelicals and I critique them. And in some ways, the Christian Reformed Church is a, it's not, it's not mainline and it's not evangelical. And in fact, the current war going on within the Christian Reformed Church is whether it be mainline or evangelical. Um, I don't think the mainline is going to win because I don't think there's enough stuff in the mainline. There's not strength in the mainline. And, and one way to understand Peterson is, and I'm going to get to this later, if there's ever a later in this video, because it's going to go on for hours at the rate I'm going. Peterson is almost a redux of the main line, but not aligning with their culture war assumptions. And, and that's why Peterson is a hot topic in the Christian Reformed Church. And this is why even people who have solid credentials in terms of CRC left, like Sid Helaman and myself, when we don't criticize Jordan Peterson like the political left does, some on the CRC left get very concerned. Boy, this gets complicated, but also fun and interesting. Anyway, so it's fascinating that Margaret Hoover, and again, no, no, here's a thesis that I have. That cat wants to be let out, but the minute that cat is let out, this dog and this cat will ruin my video. So, kitty, you stay inside. Cats are evil. I can see it in their eyes. I've just alienated all the cats lovers. I don't believe cats are evil. I have one in my house right now, but I'm trying to get rid of it. Anybody want a cat? Anyway. Too much ADHD. Margaret. Margaret Hoover chooses Buckley and 
Buckley and Graham at one level because there's a facile association with Peterson's demurring on the God question in a literalistic, tribalistic way. But that level is connected to far deeper levels because there are, there are, there are alignments and associations that continue to go down and that's what makes this conversation interesting. And, and so in a sense, I suspect, I'm not trying to take anything away from Margaret Hoover, I doubt she has followed any of this as closely as I have. But in, but in a sense, lining it up this way is, now I know all the, the unions out there will call it a synchronicity, which is fine. I, as, a, as a Reformed Christian, I'll call it providence. Uh, Got to be careful about facile associations. Anyway... Reasons for its decline. I should like to begin by asking Dr. Graham whether any scientific finding or development during his lifetime has either strained his faith or rendered it more difficult for him to preach the Christian gospel. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I can possibly do a better imitation of the Monopoly man. Anyway, Reverend Graham, let us know what you think. No, uh, I would rather say it has been the other way. I th no, I talk like a southerner. I have a smooth way of talking. And right away you have the, the lines of the culture war following the lines of the civil war and the north and south. Notice how often... And now, now, now I'm channeling John McWhorter, who isn't dead, but... I think that uh, the scientific achievements of our generation have tended to confirm the Christian faith. And uh, I think that uh, this is true uh, and can be uh, substantiated by statistics uh, among uh, polls that have ta been taken place among scientists. Uh, you know that 75% of all scientists that have ever lived, live now. And of the and now pay attention here. How do we know what is truth? Well, this is a very democratic approach to it, that we're going to count up all the sciences, scientists and believe how many of them believe in God and how many don't. This is the same justification for climate change that, you know, what percentage of scientists believe in climate change? Now, I'm not critiquing that evaluation. I'm just noting it. I'm noting how... How, how this is so deep in our culture and so deep in our bones that truth is that which the majority embrace. Now, again, if you get into the culture war conversations, well, what is a majority but a tyrant? Um, isn't democracy the tyranny of the majority? And, and aren't the courts supposed to protect the minority? And now we're getting into countless, countless. You see, there's layers to all of this stuff. You can't speak a word in your culture and not appropriate and not not express that which is deeply beneath it. And obviously what the job of clinical psychologists are is to try to expose some of these things that are beneath it. But none of us have anywhere near as much time in our life to, to expose these things, which is why action speaks louder than words. That 75%, uh, about 60% say that they believe in a personal God. And when you... Okay, now when he says personal God, now we are outlining the boundary between the mainline religion and the evangelical religion because this is what this is what Chuck Colson does with his with his conversion from being Nixon's hatchet man to becoming an evangelical Christian who must tell the truth in the court even if it means he's going to go to jail now, if that doesn't sound like Jordan Peterson's City of God, quote, what does? You have scientists like Dr. Elma Engstrom of RCA, and you have Dr. Werner von Braun, and many of these scientists who are out uh, teaching the Christian faith. Um, this was not true when I started. When I started, uh, the number of scientists uh, believing in God at that time was estimated to be about 25%. And I think many of the great scientific achievements have tended to confirm uh, the fact of God in the minds of many scientists and lead many of them to a personal faith. 
I want to ask you about your personal faith. Now, now here's something interesting. Why lead off with this clip? And again, Margaret Hoover is doing something that I don't know if she knows what she's doing because, boy, there's a lot of interesting ways you could ask Peterson about that clip. And I, what does that clip have to do with this conversation at all? Unless Margaret Hoover very much wants to bring up William F. Buckley, the the hollow days of the of the of the conservative elite, where now the conservatives are no longer elite, but we don't even have conservatives that talk this way. We have conservatives that are cute and blonde and, and look like they come from, from the Fox News set, and PBS is trying to not be so, trying to not be so, so monolithic, trying to be a little more pluralistic, so we'll give a, a, a cute blonde woman that looks like she's from the Fox News set, her own show on, on PBS, and we'll, we'll have her talk to Dr. Jordan Peterson. But what's fascinating about the juxtaposition of Billy Graham and Peterson with respect to talking about scientists is that the tribe, now you got to be careful here because the, the, the elites of the neo-evangelicals that occupy Christianity today will not be anywhere near as iconoclastic against blue church evolution as will, let's say, the word fundamentalists will on the other side. They all have their own in-house wars to fight too. Peterson's approach to science is, I mean, Peterson doesn't see science in tension with the Bible. Peter sees, Peterson sees his science as justification for the Bible, and that's responsible for, for part of the big flip that's happening via Jordan Peterson and those who rejected the Bible because of evolution. Maybe not directly, maybe not personally, maybe not self-consciously, but that's what's been in the imaginary, and this is exactly what Peterson is flipping. Peterson is saying, I believe in the Bible because of evolution, and not in a simplistic, concordistic rehashment of Genesis 1, which is what we've normally seen, but via Peterson's psychology and his study of Piaget, and his study of Jung, and boy, this is complicated, but boy, is it also fun. Okay, Jordan, let's have your answer, because I don't know. Now, let's let's again give a little bit of mercy and grace to Jordan Peterson here. He's on a set. He's doing one interview after another like a madman, and so he who who knows if he even heard anything that Buckley and Billy Graham have said. I, I don't know how much Jordan Peterson knows about Billy Graham. When I asked him about C. S. Lewis, he said a Christian apologist, which meant he, he hasn't read anything about he hasn't read much of anything from C. S. Lewis. And he probably knows next to nothing about Billy Graham, and he probably doesn't understand all of the interesting connections between Billy Graham and himself in some weird way. This is just too much fun. Christians who watch you have listened closely over the last two years about whether you self-identify as a Christian or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the National Review has, which was also the publication that William F. Buckley founded, um, has written about you the following that the effect is that the intellectual idol of millions of people is punting on the most important question in the world. It is a question of literal metaphysical truth before this question of psychology. Peterson has said that... This quote, too, is so interesting. The most important question of the world. <laughs> the neo-evangelicals won the war against William F. Buckley and won the war, either that or became a coalition with them where the religious, the re religious right joined in with the elitist right in order to try to hold off the ascendant, the ascendant culture, which was the culture that arose in the 60s. And so whereas... Chuck Colson, and Chuck Colson again epitomizes this transformation. And Karl Rove and George W. Bush 
you know, figured out how you can employ this. And, and Donald Trump continues to play from that book. You know, I don't know if Donald Trump really cares about who sits on the courts, but as long as he keeps sending conservative justices to the courts, evangelicals will vote for him and and Christians on the right. Now, now let me say something here. 48% of people who identify as Christians in America vote Democratic, okay? Now, if you watch the news, if you watch the mainstream media, on both sides, Fox is part of it, the other, the alternative mainstream, they, they tend to create some facile associations that I hear echoing in emails that I get from many of you. The, the Christian church is about as split as the country, okay? And this is part of what makes Peterson such an interesting figure in this. So let's continue with uh, Liam Warner's quote. That he behaves as if God exists, but he lectures as if he doesn't. It would be helpful for his fans and himself if he addressed the heart of the West crisis and meaning, God, yes or no. Peterson's going to answer what he always answers. But why does Liam Warner think that this is the heart of the crisis? Is he an evangelical? Did Billy Graham win the day? Did William F. Buckley, do the, do the two sides of, of Chuck Colson, have they come together? Have they integrated their, have they integrated their evangelical self? This is what's playing out in the intellectual dark web in terms of the conversation between Peterson and, and Sam Harris. But in some ways, it's playing out on the other side. Why not take on this question of the existence of God? Take it on? This is exactly what he's been talking about. You watch the biblical lectures. This is all about the existence of God. He just can't get to a short answer, which is exactly what he says. He's not punting. Because it's not something to reduce to a soundbite, fundamentally. But your lectures are two hours long. This is true, but when you're talking about the most... His lectures are the answer to the question. We just don't understand what he's saying. Most important questions that people have ever asked, and two hours isn't very long. Apparently, people will watch them. So I'm not, I'm not prepared to. I'm not prepared to say things in any other way than I've already said them. You know, there. It isn't obvious what belief means. People think that what they believe is what they say they believe. I don't believe that. I believe that what people believe is what they act out. And so I said, I act as if God exists. That's a sufficient statement as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> He's such a stubborn Northern Canadian. <laughs> if you watch the... Um... If you watch Chasing the Dream, my sister's show, that's my that's my brother-in-law there without his shirt on, who's, you know, fixing up the house with, with whatever's handy. He's from Brandon, Manitoba. And um and you know, I talked to Julian. Julian's from Manitoba. And these these northern Canadians, they're they're a piece of work. And you know, if you push them, they're just gonna push back. You know, what's the old saying? By their fruits ye shall know them. What's the old saying? Yeah, it's old because it's in the Bible. And who says it? Jesus. You know, what's so funny about Peterson here is he, he's, he's very careful about this game because he could have answered this question. Well, I'm dragging my very heavy cross up the up the very long hill to the city of God or the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. By your fruits you shall know them. I'm quoting Jesus. He doesn't say quoting Jesus. He says the very old saying. Now, is this in Peterson's head? Or does he intentionally decide, well, I'm not going to reference Jesus who actually gives this quote, or I'm going to take it away from Jesus so as not to make it a religious quote because because uh, boys and girls, we are still living in Christendom. And the culture war is a Christendom civil war that every Muslim or person from another culture recognizes, but we can't see it ourselves. That secularism is a late stage Christianity. That's what it is. And that in many ways, 
atheists are in denial. And what Jordan Peterson is doing is bringing this thing back around. Same idea, right? It's, it's a matter of action and a matter of commitment. It's not a matter of me parading out my, my, my explicit statements about a metaphysical reality that's virtually impossible to comprehend. See, again, he could have said, well, let me quote Jesus. By your fruits you will know them. And he could have said, well, pretty much every time Jesus, the Son of Man and Son of God, uses all this language and maps of meaning, why won't he use it on this stage? Well, he's got his reasons. And we're going to get into those in Node of Network in a little while. Because it's all about language. You risk when you reduce. And... I'm not willing to do that, and I'm not interested in providing people with easy answers, including me. So, there's a I, question of whether you're working it out yourself. Of course, yeah. and everyone who's honest is working it out themselves. None of us have incontrovertible knowledge about what transcends our understanding. You know. Now, now to to the Jungians out there who who love to say, "We don't believe; we know." Um, did you hear what he just said? Because in this way, Peterson and I are on the same page. Now you might say, "Well, Vanderclay, you're a you're a Christian minister, don't you believe? Yeah, do you use the language of believe? Yeah. If she would ask you, would you punt? No. Would you sound more like Billy Graham? Probably. Why is Peterson? Why is Peterson giving this answer in this way in this context? That's very interesting. No, like I certainly do think. I've learned things. I've learned that the deeper I go into the biblical stories and into religious mythology in general, cross-culturally, the less I see any bottom. You can go in it, into it forever. And, and I've learned an immense amount doing that. And Is he saying that the Bible is inspired? Now think of, listen to his answer and think about this. When you think about, you know, dig deeper below the words, okay? So when you say, well, the Bible is inspired, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you mean that the, 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 the ultimate source of the Bible is from God? Okay. Well, for a Christian, isn't the ultimate source of the entire creation we're in from God? Yeah. And isn't the fact that as we go in deeper and deeper and look at particle physics, as we go in deeper and deeper into, into the nature of matter, we discover that it just keeps going? Yeah. Well, why is that? Well, what, why is it that that seems to happen when we go into the Bible? Well, what does it mean that, the, that a book is inspired? What does it mean that the book is called the Word of God? And So again, you know, what is all this, how does all this language work? And why do we choose the words and the language? And why do we appropriate the associations that we do in a particular context for a particular means towards a particular end? Much of it has transformed my life. So, and, and I also believe that much of it has transformed my life. Now, again, you could translate all of these words into evangelical language. Well, to quote Jesus, by your fruits you shall know them. So I'm not so as, as I'm not as interested in words as I am in deed. And to quote Jesus, um, not one jot or tittle will will disappear. Well, to quote, I mean, he could be, he's quoting Jesus all throughout this thing. He's but 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 not not Peterson. This, he's using his, this is, this is the fruit of his theology. This is his life's work. This is what he's been doing all of his life. Now, to what degree is this self-conscious? I mean, if, if we were to switch chairs and I were to become Jordan Peterson's shrink, I could turn around and say, well, okay, Jordan, well, why are you choosing the words that you're using here? What, what are you afraid of? What, what are you afraid of being associated with? Who are you afraid of being associated with? The, that the West is grounded on the metaphysical presupposition that human beings have a spark of the divine in them. And I don't think there's a... Tr Let's retranslate that line. Well, the West has founded that human beings are made in the image of God, in the imago dei, and he could have appropriated Christian language, the spark of the divine. Well... Where is that coming from? Well, it kind of comes from the Quakers. Well, now we're into Quaker associations, and 
truer way of saying that, and I also believe that it's true. Now, what that means with regards to the ultimate metaphysical realities that, that ground the entire world, I, I, I dare not say, because I don't know. So I... This is the Church of Jordan Peterson. It really is. And it's a, it's a church of one. I should look up that whatever crazy name he gave to this church. Peugeot and I are talking tomorrow. We'll see what we talk about. tend to try to say what I know and to leave the rest alone. And, and there's plenty I don't know and plenty I can't talk about. So, but I'm talking about what I can. I'm not interested in joining a club. <laughs> All right, I'll sit in the therapist chair again and say, okay, Jordan, what are you afraid of in terms of joining a club? Regardless of what the club is, so. Hmm. What are you afraid of in terms of joining a club, regardless of what the club is? Are you afraid of being accountable to other people? Well, that would very much make you a Westerner. Um, I'm not going to make statements of reflecting a certainty that I don't have, so. I, I think you've got quite a bit of certainty. But again, I think the, the question is tribal language. What is your approach to truth? I try to, my approach to truth, you know, if you wouldn't do so, if you wouldn't work so hard, maybe you'd be a little bit more rested for some of these things. Now, one of the things I'm picking up from Peterson, back when he did the Lafayette interview, when I read that, when I watched that, and I was reading him, I thought, he seems frustrated and angry, and perhaps the setting is hostile. And I totally misrepresented that because the questioner then chimed into my, chimed into my, chimed into my uh, my video on it and said, no, I'm a huge fan. And when in the conversation with David Fuller, people said, well, Peterson is, is angry with you. I was like, well, it doesn't matter if he's angry with me or not. Um, Peterson and I don't have a personal relationship. Um, you know, we don't, we don't even know each other. But I, I think a lot of what happens here is, is this is, this is Peterson working hard and thinking hard because she, she is, he is, he is, he is being very, you don't, when you interview someone, this is exactly the kind of person you want to interview because he is going to try to tell you the truth as best he can, and he's going to work hard at the answer, and this is exactly what he's doing here. And I think at the end of it, he'll say, this is fun because this is how he is. This is what a good conversation is. This is free speech. This goes down to the heart of who he is and what he is. I try not to say things that make me weak. All right, and it's, I didn't know this, but you know what? does one, that mean? If you pay attention to what you say, if you, and, with, and I mean pay attention to it, if you pay attention to how the words make you feel, then you can tell when you're saying something that is founded on a rock and not on sand, and that's what you should do. And uh, uh, you just quoted Jesus again. It means you have to pay attention to every word you say. And so, so, and there's a rule here. The rule is something like this. You can plot your way through life. You can plot and scheme your way through life. You can do what's expedient, let's say, instead of what's meaningful. From 12 Rules for Life. Or you can say what you believe to be true and you can take the consequences. And that, as far as I'm concerned, that's the fundamental call to responsibility. Did you hear that? Do you remember what he just said to David Fuller? There's the kingdom of God. He's answering your questions. He's telling you exactly what he thinks. He's not using the language that certain communities use. He's making up his own language. This is what Peterson does. But he just quoted Jesus, and he just basically gave you his definition of the kingdom of God. Why are you afraid of being weak? Well, it's the weakness that I was referring to. Well, it's, 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 it's. See, and I think Margaret Hoover's question here, it's not a bad question, but, but you can hear these questions being heard by the different tribes because now we're, we're living in the age of Trump. So this is, Trump is our principality and power, okay? 
And, and when someone says, well, Trump is not my president. Well, no, he really is. Well, I didn't vote for him. Well, whether or not you vote for him doesn't make him your president. Why? Because you're still a citizen of this country. And if you acted as if Trump isn't your president, you would probably have to leave the United States and renounce your citizen and try citizenship and try to become a citizen of whatever country you believe adequately reflects it. And if, in fact, you play that out, that's exactly what people do in terms of their churches, which speaks deeply about our culture. Fear. <laughs> It's essentially fear of hell. If you make yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm listening now, Jordan. I'm listening now. It's fear of hell. I'm beginning to understand your language. Is he answering her question? She would probably walk away from this interview and say he didn't really answer the question. He punted again. He's not punting. He's talking Petersonian. He's quoting Jesus all along, and he's saying, what is weak? Weak is hell. What is strength? Strength is heaven. It's archetypal. Weak. Life is very hard. If you make yourself weak and you suffer stupidly because of it, you will become bitter. And once you become bitter, you will become vengeful. And after vengeful, there is no limit. That's one of the things I learned from studying totalitarianism. He's talking about hell. Go back and listen to him in how many places when he talks about hell, talks about literal hell, talks about totalitarian governments. In, in a strange way, Peterson is continuing to fight the Cold War. And again, if I would sit down, I'm not a therapist, I'm a pastor, so I'm not going to sit in a therapist chair. I'd say, you know, now Jordan, I know the area, you, I know the time that you grew up. I grew up in the same time. When you were a young boy, the world was fighting the Cold War. We, we appropriated God just as the Avengers appropriate Thor to try and fight against the principalities and powers of the evil empire or the evil kingdom. Okay? The evil empire. Isn't that what Ronald Reagan said? Didn't Ronald Reagan on his, his last speech given as president, president talk about this shining city on the hill? Well, all the doors open. Well, Trump closed the doors. We're still living in Christendom, boys and girls in the 20th century, because I studied it from the psychological perspective. I wasn't interested in the mass movements. I was interested in the motivations of the cruelest Auschwitz guard. What was he up to? Or the, or the person who went and shot up the, the elementary school in Connecticut. What was he up to exactly? Just exactly where did he dwell and why? It's like, well, weakness made him suffer stupidly and that made him cruel and that was just the beginning. And so, that weakness, that's just, if you make yourself weak by engaging in deceit, if you fail to take responsibility, then you transform yourself into something that cannot bear to endure the structure of existence. And you will torture yourself. And, and that leads to very bad places. You can almost hear C.S. Lewis's definition of hell if you read The Great Divorce right in that answer. It's just in Petersonian. Very bad places. Um, you've said that you don't... I now, if Peterson were to say, well, if you're a bad person, you go to hell, well, that's common religion, and many people would have understood it. But this is Petersonian. He says things differently. And didn't self-identify as a conservative as mm. recently as five years ago. But I think it's fair to say there are many on the left who are fearful of you and your message now. And I wonder if you have a reflection on why that is. They have every reason to be. He's a, he's a social, he's a culture warrior. Why is he a culture warrior? Because the religious and the political are not that different. Well, 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 well don't say that, Vander Clay. Well, remember, I'm a religious believer and a political skeptic. Well, why do I say that? Because I have a great degree of skepticism about what the political will do and whether the political will usher in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or the city of God. Now pay attention to Peterson's individualism. Why? I'm not a fan of collectivists. I'm not a fan of people who put group identity first. I'm, I'm not a fan of people who would dare to identify as Marxists after what happened in the 20th century. I'm not a fan of university professors who think their job is to take impressionable 18-year-olds and turn them into political act. Now Peterson puts on the prophetic mantle despite the fact that they're not educated. So 
the collectivists, and I don't care whether they're on the left or the right, by the way, because I'm no fan of right-wing collectivists either. So the right level of analysis is the individual, and that's what the West got right. And so, Are you a political centrist? I'm not really political. That's the... This is the funniest answer. Um, and again, he's, he's not lying. He's telling you the truth. Thing is that, and, and what I've been doing. Well, you're talking about Marxism and fascism and the left versus the right. Yeah. And you well, talk about, point, you, you talk yin about... and yang and women and men and this sort of balance mm. and Taoism and Buddhism. And I wonder if. Well, at some point, the political, political gets so out of hand that it's no longer political. It's philosophical or theological. But there's lots of places where the political level of analysis. I can only use, go back to, and again, note in the network, I guess this was at the Ayn Ayn Rand Institute. I can only use theological language when I'm talking to people about good and evil. Why? And again, we're going to get down to that video. This is the right one. People who analyzed, deep people who analyzed what happened in the Soviet Union, people like Viktor Frankl, of course he concentrated more on Nazi Germany, but it doesn't matter, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn noted that one of the reasons those societies could manifest themselves the way they did was because individual people were willing to lie about almost everything. And they considered that the fundamental issue, that it was the moral failings of each person at the level of the individual that was actually the cause of the totalitarian catastrophe. And that's not political. So in other words, the individual brings on not the opposite of the kingdom of the, the kingdom of God or the city of God, which is hell. It's the individual that brings on hell, and the individual brings that on via deceit. And again, Peterson has said this over and over and over again. That's psychological or philosophical or theological. It's not political. It's a matter of it's a matter of your relationship not only to your conscience but to your soul. And we don't teach that properly. And that's why I've addressed this as a psychologist. I only got dragged into the political because my idiot government thought it was okay to put, to demand a certain form of speech. She liked that, she liked that. In the name of compassion. And that was a no-go no zone as far as I was concerned. So I'll take responsibility for my words, but, and, and I'm not willing to have someone wave a moral flag and then tell me what I have to say. That's not happening. So why lead off with William F. Buckley and and or Billy Graham. For him to... Oh, that has more resonance here than Margaret Hoover knows. But again, this gets back to what I'd said in a lot of my earlier videos in terms of you know, what are we up here? And we know this from the psychologists. What are we up here? We are, and actually Jonathan Peugeot gets into this in his second uh, Santa Claus God video, ontology video, that you know, we are our listeners are in here and they're giving us ideas and we don't know why we're putting forth these ideas. We are not transparent to ourselves. We are not conscious of our motivations. We are not conscious of what we are doing. We are doing things that we're not aware of. And Peterson is doing that too. And as Peterson says again and again, he's trying harder and harder and harder to be as, as in control of himself as he can. And if you talk to the, the Buddhists, and, and their meditation and what they're trying to do. There's an interesting, there's an interesting tension in Buddhism in terms of if you decide to get rid of your ego, what is deciding to get rid of the ego? Well, it's you. Well, if you're trying to, if you're trying to eliminate the illusion of the self, you know, think about this via Descartes. If you're trying to get rid of the illusion of yourself, well, well, what exactly is trying to do that? Well, isn't that you? In other words, if you actually achieve it, isn't that, in an ironic sense, the ultimate victory of the ego? Because it wins. Because there's something in you that decides you want to take on the project of eliminating the, the illusion of yourself. So you don't get away from you. You can't get away from you. That was, um, that was Descartes' insight, I think. You, you don't have to finish the sentence. Once you have an I, well, I'm going to get rid of the I. I'm going to get rid of the I. Well, I'm going to try and not imagine there is an I. 
The eye's still there. So Billy Graham comments about scientists, sets up the American evangelical tribal individualism approach. Billy Graham is fighting a internal Christendom civil war against the mainliners. We're going to count the scientists. We're going to see how they identify. Truth is found in this democratic process. We're going to try and get Jordan Peterson to self-identify as a Christian so he can be counted and he can be used in terms of this ongoing Christendom civil war. Peterson won't play this game. He doesn't see the need to play the game. He doesn't like the game. Now, just this morning, I read an email from someone who said, Peterson in part four, which I had covered before, of the message, of his Easter message, talks about not the city of God, but the kingdom of God. Now, remember, these are synonymous. These are synonymous for Peterson. And as I get into Augustine and Plato, we'll get into, we'll dig deeper into some of these ideas. But listen to all of part four again. Now, having heard his answer given to David Fuller and see what you think. The cross, Easter message one, abridged from Wikipedia. The Ark of the Covenant was a lidded, gold-leafed wooden chest containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. According to various texts within the Hebrew Bible, it also contained Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. God was said to have spoken with Moses from between the two cherubim on the ark's cover. The biblical account states that the ark was created a year after the Israelite exodus from Egypt, according to a pattern given to Moses by God at the foot of Mount Sinai. Thereafter, the gold-plated acacia chest was carried by its staves while en route by the Levites in advance of the people when on the march towards the Promised Land, or at the head of the Israelite army. In transport, the ark was concealed under a large veil made of skins and blue cloth, carefully hidden even from the eyes of the priests and the Levites who carried it. When at rest, a portable building, the tabernacle, meaning residence or dwelling place, was set up to house the ark. It was built of woven layers of curtains along with 48 boards clad with polished gold standing like vertical blinds. Solomon's temple in Jerusalem superseded it as the dwelling place of God some 300 years later. Commentary. There has to be a bridge between the finite and the infinite. There has to be a place where the ephemeral meets the eternal. There has to be a bridge between the knowable and the unknowable. And there has to be bedrock at the foundation. The ark, which is the portal to God, is to be carried on the shoulders of those who are holy. So the portal to God. What does the ark create? What does the ark represent? What does Israel become? with the presence of God dwelling in its midst. Now, if you read the book of Exodus and you read the last chapters of the book of Revelation, one of the things I went through Exodus in my Sunday school class a number of years ago, I spent 75 weeks on the book of Exodus. Why? On the book of Revelation. Why? The book of Revelation, in some ways, like a good conclusion for a book, ties so much of the Bible together. Now, you might look at that and say, well, that's a horrible book to do that because the book is, the book is so mythological. Well, well, why does the book of Revelation do that? And why does the book of Revelation do that so well? Well, Revelation has a lot of exodus in it because it's, it's representing... Exodus is a first draft of the city of God. It is not to be touched. To touch the ark is to risk death. Why isn't it to be touched? Well, go into a museum, and what can't you do in that museum? You can't touch the paintings. You can't touch the artwork. Why not? What does not touching 
create in our community. It creates the sacred. It communicates the sacred. When a child goes into the museum and reaches out his hand, it's the most natural thing in the world for that child to do is to touch the painting and his mother will slap the child's hand down. Don't touch. The sacred has been built into it, Sam Harris. There are holy things that cannot be touched except at mortal risk. Except at mortal risk think that through. Those things that cannot be touched are at the very foundation of the community. Those things that cannot be touched are at the very foundation of the community. Again, slow it down. Think it through. Why is that? You don't have a community without the sacred. The ark must be placed at the center of the temple. The temple or the tabernacle, just go to your study Bible if you can find one and look at a map of, you can see it, see it represented in picture. Israel is camped around the ark. The ark leads it. Why? is what is axiomatic. The people following the ark have determined to journey together toward the eternal promised land. Now, again, if I... In the age to come, I'm going to study art history. Because look at... I'm not going to have to keep the cursor open. Look at this person. Look at how they're dressed. Well, why are they dressed like this? Well, they're, they're, they're not, you know, we're not looking at the exodus around, let's say, 1200 BC. Look at how they're dressed. Look at how he's dressed. Well, this is the... Well, what is this? Why is it represented this way? The city arranged properly around the Ark of the Covenant is eternal Jerusalem. There's the city of God... Something must be axiomatic, or everything shakes and falls. You cannot have a community without which, without that which is axiomatic. Uh, Think Club, I just watched their video on, on Peterson and Sam Harris, or Peterson and um, uh, Rationality Rules, uh, dude. And what's axiomatic for the celebrity atheists? Reason. Rationality. Materialism. You cannot have a community without that which is axiomatic. The axiomatic cannot be expressed fully in words. Instead... Ah, there's a difference between Peterson and Harris. The axiomatic cannot be expressed fully in words. Now we're going to have to get into this, Jordan, with respect to your behaviors. The axiomatic, untouchable and unshakable, is what makes communication in words possible. You can't talk unless you have the axiomatic. Well, why? Well, what is language dependent on? Language is dependent on community. We've already asserted you can't have community without the axiomatic. So there must be something deep down below us if we're actually to be able to communicate with each other at all. The axiomatic is a spirit, a process. Nagoquist, process theology, well, God as process, yes and no. A living force. Its manifestations, however, are concrete. That is the transformation of the spirit into matter. So, what do people do? Why are our actions the best teller of that which is axiomatic in us? Because it's by way of our actions do we incarnate the axiom. That is the generation of the tablets of stone. The Ark of the Covenant contains the rules that are derived in the first order from the axiomatic principle. That principle is the spirit that made the rules manifest. That spirit is the ultimate inhabitant of the Ark and the rules the result of its action. That spirit is the creative logos. The Ark of the Covenant and the Temple are replaced by the cathedral at the center of the community. The cathedral is... 
Now, we're talking a medieval town here, where the cathedral is the center of the community, and it's the cross. Of course, the, Medi the, the medievals acted this out. It's the cross in architectural form. The cross is where the transformation takes place. The transformation is the incorporation of the body of Christ. So what is the town? Well, the town is the city of God. God is the principal, and the principality is the town. Textual form. The cross is where the transformation takes place. The transformation is the incorporation of the body of Christ. That incorporation is a dramatic ritual. So when Margaret Hoover asks him, why won't you tell us what you believe? He says, I act it out. Christ is he who transcends death by voluntarily accepting death. Christ Isn't this his comment about the city on the hill? Christ is he who rejects the kingdoms of this world for the kingdom of God. Isn't this why Peterson says he's not political? Christ is he who speaks the truth that creates the habitable order that is good from the chaos of potential that exists prior to the materialization of reality. Christ is he who wields potential as the sword that cleaves death. Christ is he whose radical acceptance of the conditions of life defeats the hatred, bitterness, and vengefulness that the tragedy and malevolence that taints being otherwise produces. He defeats hell. That's, those are the definitions of hell he used in the Hoover interview. Without the acceptance of death, bitterness rules. This is exactly what he said in the Hoover interview. Hello, hummingbird. And hell triumphs. That's the totalitarian system, where hell triumphs. Christ is the potential of man and woman. It is said that man and woman alike are made in the image of God, and that God is he who uses the eternal logos to generate habitable order from the chaos of potential. This is the... If you listen to what he's saying here, isn't he saying Christ reigns? Isn't he saying Jesus is Lord? Isn't he saying that this Jesus has the power? Well, how does this Jesus manifest his power? The axiom. This is the diamond at the center of the world. This is the spirit in the ark that is untouchable. This is the bedrock of the culture that brings peace and prosperity and that respects the dignity of man. Isn't this our culture? Isn't this our culture he is trying to save? This is the great truth. This is the responsibility whose acceptance allows each of us to live despite the catastrophic fragility of our limited being. Our likeness to God gives each of us a value that transcends the finite. There's the Imago Dei. Individual and society alike are charged with the ethical demand to respect that value. This is not only the presumption that grounds the idea of the rights of man, it is the presumption that lays upon each of us the ultimate responsibility that is the inevitable corollary of those rights. Face the chaos of the future. Employ the logos of which you are a part. Now he's turning preacher. To transform that chaos into the habitable order that is good. Speak the truth. Embody the truth. Onward Christian soldiers marching unto war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Accept impossibly the limitations that make being possible. Dispense in that manner with resentment, hatred, and the desire for infinite and unbounded vengeance and all the cruelty and evil that accompanies it. That's hell, remember? Remember the Hoover interview. Pick up the cross of your tragedy and betrayal accept its terrible weight, hoist it onto your shoulders and struggle impossibly upward toward the kingdom of God on the hill. Up, hoist it 
onto your shoulders and struggle impossibly upward toward the kingdom of God on the hill. Accept its terrible weight. Hoist it onto your shoulders and struggle impossibly upward toward the kingdom of God on the hill. Accept its terrible weight. Hoist it onto your shoulders and struggle impossibly upward toward the kingdom of God on the hill. And accept its terrible weight. Hoist it onto your shoulders and struggle impossibly upward toward the kingdom of God on the hill. He is acting out his gospel. This is what he's doing. He keeps telling us it's exactly what he's doing. The alternative is death and hell. Part five. There it is. There it is. This is what he said with, to David Fuller. You stumble uphill with your burden towards the city of God. That's the story. What does that mean, the city of God, to you? I would say that everyone bears maximal responsibility and speaks the truth. That's what it is. And what's the responsibility? You're responsible for the suffering in the world. You're responsible for the malevolence in the world. You're responsible for the veracity of your utterances. In the city of God, you're maximally responsible for the suffering. You finally, you're finally maximally responsible for the benevolence, and you speak the truth. That's what it is. Okay. What do Peterson's actions say? Contemporary cultic behaviors don't matter. See, this is where he and Billy Graham would not agree. But ancient cultic behaviors were the axiomatic foundations of the society. Now, this is where you can get into Jamie Smith. Jamie Smith is a professor of philosophy at Calvin College, just wrote another book. He's been doing a series of books. He talks a lot about cultural, liter cultural liturgies. What do our cultural, cultural liturgies suggest to us about what we believe and who we are i'm going to pause the video because i want to pull up a i want to pull up a so i just pulled up a an article from the christian century now the christian century for those of you who don't know the the different tribal elements of 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 the church world christian century is a mainline uh, organ and you can see right away can we talk about guns? A conversational guide to the editors of Christian Century. And, and by your fruit, you will know them. And so they want to talk about gun control. Well, here in the Christian Century, uh, Jason Michelli, who is a pastor in a Washington, D.C., in a church in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., writes really a very penetrating review, I think, of Jamie Smith's newest book, Awaiting the King. And... Jamie Smith has made a name for himself by talking about cultural liturgies. And what he's saying is that, you know, we act out that which we believe. Now, Jamie Smith, if you follow him on Twitter, not a Peterson fan. Um, uh, <laughs> I've got my own interesting history with Jamie Smith on Twitter. Um, Jamie Smith. Smith is part of my tribe, and he's got quite a bit more status in my tribe than I do. But uh, I won't turn this into a critique of Jamie Smith. Smith does a lot of good work, um, and he's he's dealing with he's dealing with Howarus, Howarus, and John Howard Yoder. And that, that's the Anabaptist wing of the church versus the Kyperian wing, which is the tribe, the, the sub-tribe that I belong. It's talking about how of us as resident aliens versus Jamie Smith's now awaiting the king. Basically, the heart of this interview is that uh, we are formed, Christians come to the church formed by secular liturgies, Okay. Full disclosure, I'm a card-carrying Howrus uh, Mafia. I'm moved 
by his vision of the church forming Christians into a contrast community, but I'm also sufficiently appreciative of Smith's work to concede a point that he doesn't make explicit, but that it necessarily follows from his work. We, the church, are not anywhere near sufficiently forming Christians to achieve either Kuyper's or Hauerwas's vision for public theology. We're playing chaplain and cheerleader to people whose faith is being formed elsewhere, shaped by one another, who just might be the enemy. Now, Peter's... Uh, why do I spend more time talking about Peterson than Jamie Smith? Because I... Oh, the dog. Hang on. Jamie Smith. Jamie Smith is addressing the church. Jamie Smith is, is facilitating a conversation within the church about our formation. Peterson is not living in the church. Peterson is not addressing the church, even though a lot of us in the church are listening. I don't find Jamie Smith bread-pilling a lot of unbelievers. It's not a knock. Most preachers preach to the choir. We preach within the church. It's not a knock. Jesus came to the Jews. I think the reason I'm paying more attention to Jordan Peterson than Jamie Smith is I think Jordan Peterson is actually doing more. I got into this thing because... It began to dawn on me, dawn on me that it may very well be possible that Jordan Peterson is the most effective evangelist of our age. It's a heck of a thing for someone who doesn't associate with the church. Now I say that with with a degree of trepidation, because within our culture there's a consistent belief that the church is unnecessary. And I don't share that belief or I wouldn't be a minister in it. We also have a belief that the church is post-Christendom. That the cathedral is no longer sitting at the center of the culture. And that's true. The question is, what does sit at the center of the culture? What happened in the wake of the Reformation when, perhaps what happened in the Reformation was that the church was finally displaced from the center of the culture. And in the Peace of Augsburg, where the faith of the prince dictated the faith of the community, well, that of course led up to the, the bloody wars, post-Reformation wars, which then set up, of course, Thomas Jefferson and John Locke and the belief in a secular, non-religious society, which is what we're in. And in a sense, Sam Harris and others are asking for the complete elimination of the religious, which in my opinion is simply laughable, because all you do it is push it beneath the surface, which makes it no mystery why of all people, of all professions, a psychologist comes along and says, maybe you should look under the hood. Maybe you should ask yourself what's really going on down deep below the surface. Maybe you might want to talk about that. Maybe you might want to find some language that addresses that. Well, what kind of language may we be able to use to address that? And again, Peterson in the, in the, the four, he was in there with Reuben and, and two other guys and Peterson. And, and Peterson says, I find when I'm talking to patients, I need to use theological language. And this is exactly what Sam Harris is trying to exercise from our community, theological language. He wants theological language to be a no-go zone. Margaret Hoover basically puts on William F. Buckley and Billy Graham and says, come on, Peterson, use the language, theological language. And he says, I won't do it here. Why not? 
Did he make the right decision? Probably, because here's the irony. She's not having preachers on her program. Well, she may get Tim Keller. He's, he's reached that kind of status, but, or maybe Rick Warren. Remember, remember the drama? If you don't know it, look it up. Um, Barack Obama had Rick Warren pray at his first inauguration. In his second inauguration, Giglio, I think that's how you say his name, who was who was not sufficiently woke on same-sex marriage, was 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 deplatformed, was disinvited from Obama's second inaugural. It's a minor point, but church people saw it. Church people are paying attention to these things. Why? Well, Peterson says, well, it depends on how you act. Well, here's the thing about the medieval village. Everyone acted with respect to the symbols. That's what made it religious. You say, well, I'm not going to, I'm only going to use this, this religious language in certain contexts. Okay. Contemporary cultic behaviors don't matter, but ancient cultic behaviors were the axiomatic foundation or expression of the belief of the community. Preachers are liars. I already did a video on that. Yes, we are. We're also thieves. And I'm looking to rob Jordan Peterson blind. Preachers are liars. What game was Billy Graham playing? He was playing a game of inside Christendom culture war, trying to take people who were sufficiently illuminated by God number one and open them up to God number two. That's what Billy Graham was doing in 1969. What game does answering the believe in God question play? Peterson is playing a different game. He is trying to promote God one and saying, I'll leave to God number two out of it for now. I'll be an open agnostic on God aspect two. Now, a new Facebook friend since the, the dawning of my Jordan Peterson video career, I won't he doesn't use his name here. I won't dox him. He might come into the comment section. Note in the network he has a little, has a little YouTube channel. God bless his little YouTube channel because he's, he's, he's doing exactly what I'm doing in terms of working through the Peterson stuff and he's doing his homework and he's, he's digging out the roots and he's finding Northrop Fry all over the place in terms of Jordan Peterson and it makes perfect sense. And so he did a response video to myself and Andrew Sweeney's conversation and before that he had a missing link video where he goes into more details and it's I'll put the I'll put the channel in the comments if I remember um, if not you know you're probably listening to this go ahead and dox yourself and out yourself if you want because you're doing good work because basically what what he says is that well Peterson is getting this stuff from Northrop Fry who gets it from Vico which is not without its critics if you look at reviews of, of, of Fry's book that are still on the web. But, but what he's saying is that there are, we've had different, again, this is another schema, um, to what degree does it correlate or reflect the truth, but there, we use different languages to articulate different things. And, and we're in a third stage language, which is, a, which is a concrete level. Now, what's interesting is that there's associations between these languages and psychological development too. So, so in some weird way, Peterson is able to bring Northrop Fry and Piaget into the same conversation. And maps of meaning is what, you know, if maps of meaning is the love child between Northrop Fry and Jean Piaget, you know, don't get too um, literal with that one. But th this is what Peterson's doing. This is what he's been doing his whole life. He's trying to put his world together. This is what we're doing. We're trying to put our worlds together. And so you can't not talk about God. And in that, Margaret Hoover is right. You can't not talk about God. Why? God aspect one, you're always relating to God. Well, what do you mean by God? Well, God aspect one, um, Christians say regularly, there's no escaping God whether you think he is watching or not. When you read in the Old Testament, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're not an atheist. They're saying God doesn't see. God doesn't see us. 
when we're doing these things. No one will hold us accountable. The city of the city on the hill. When I when I first listened to this from Peterson, I thought, yeah, we go up the city of the hill for judgment day. Where we have to take maximum responsibility for everything that we've done. You can't come up with a better analog for judgment day. And you can find this in chick tracks. And only you evangelicals out know out there know what chick tracks are. And if you want to look up chick tracks, just go ahead and Google them. There are all these little cartoon tracks that have been given out by evangelicals for the last 30, 40 years. And <laughs> yeah, you can just go ahead and look up chick tracks. You can find them on the web. A little funny little corner of evangelicalism. But you know, chick tracks major in Judgment Day, where there's the big screen and there's the glowy dude on the throne, and there's all the people and all of the things of our lives are exposed. You can find this in the little Baptisty church that you grew up with, and this is Judgment Day. This is what Peterson says, the city on the hill. And so when I heard this, I thought, yeah, we go up to the hill, and this is Peter Kreef's Between Heaven and Hell. I get the title correct this time, where you've got C.S. Lewis. John F. Kennedy and Aldous Huxley, and they're in a moment, is it purgatory? They're in a moment between, see, this is why I keep saying between earth and heaven. I'm not a universalist, uh, but between heaven and hell, because John F. Kennedy, who is embodying nominal Catholicism, modernistic mainline Christianity, the mainlinest version of Catholicism from the 60s. Aldous Huxley, that is, that is, that is representing the community that has appropriated Eastern thought and secularized it in order to apply it to America. Because if you take Buddhism out of China or Japan, and or Tibet, and you bring it to America, it is a different thing. And Orthodox Christianity, as Lewis continues to try to repristinate Christianity and explain it to an audience, and go ahead and, and read Lewis's reflections on the years that he tried being a lay preacher to RAF pilots who were battling, who were, who were waging the battle for Britain in the air. We're not that far from 1963, the year I was born, and the year that Lewis and Kennedy and Huxley died. We're just half of an old man. I guess that's me. Christians say there is no, you, there's no escaping God, and this is what Peterson is. We, we thought God could be disposed of, but here comes Jordan Peterson, and now... If you look at Matthew 11, and Jesus is asked about John the Baptist. So, so Jonathan Pizzou says Peterson is Cyrus. I think Peterson is more John the Baptist. Peterson is really a John the Baptist. Well, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is Jesus, for Pete's sake. I just saw, oh, it was, it was the White Horse Inn article written by uh, Truman. Um, Carl Truman, I think, um, writes for First Things quite a bit. Good writer, good thinker. Um, is Peterson a sign of the end times? Well, if you're a Christian, we've been living in the end times since the resurrection of Jesus. But there, there's a John the Baptist quality to Peterson. And, and if you look at what Jesus says about John the Baptist in Matthew 11 and... It's interesting that my take on John the Baptist is John the Baptist never really quite got Jesus. But but there's but then Jesus reflects on himself and how how poorly he's received. And and this is this is Peterson. He's he's too religious for Sam Harris, but he's not religious enough for the church or the Christian community. This is interesting. This is so interesting. Does the cultic matter to God, to Sam Harris? Yeah. Jordan Peterson, we want you to say, I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Jordan Peterson, won't you please say it? Jordan Peterson says, no, I won't. We keep going around the triangle. You can find that in my video on the office. He keeps, Peterson keeps teasing us. He's not teasing us. He's not playing with us. He's telling us the truth. 
Peterson's working this stuff out. And so evangelicals, will he join our tribe? Will he, will he, and the Catholics, will he become Roman Catholic and the Orthodox? He's already Orthodox and he doesn't know it. Fun, fun, fun. Here's the craziest thing. I think probably the most telling thing about Peterson's answer in the, in the, in the Rebel Wisdom video. That, um. Peterson, in a sense, on the top of the hill, expresses Judgment Day, but there is no grace. Now, this gets into a lot of really long-running, deep conversations about the meaning of the cross. If you take responsibility for the malevolence that you've dealt out in the world, is that sufficient? What does it mean to take responsibility? In a way, Peterson is talking purgatory. Well, what does that mean? Well, purgatory in, in medieval Roman Catholic theology is the place where you finally pay for your sins. Now, as C.S. Lewis will, will remind 20th century Christians, Everyone who goes to purgatory eventually gets to heaven. What a church historian will remind is that the entire indulgence business was set up. And that's what Luther attacks. And the Protestants take out purgatory because it's not found in scripture. And but purgatory lingers because we don't really know how we get from sinful human being who not only is responsible for the malevolence in the world, but God calls us to account. And in the Protestant Reformation, we say it was at the cross that that accounting gets done. And so in many ways, what the Reformation is, is another chapter in the ongoing conversations about medieval theology. Reformation is late medievalism, just like secularism is late Christendom. Now it's imagined by Sam Harris and others that secularism will simply yield the Star Trek universe where well, there's no getting rid of Christianity. There's no exercising this demon, Sam. And Jordan Peterson is the expression of that. There's no getting away from it. There's no there, there's no leaving mythology and stepping out into pure science, and Thomas Nagel is more right than you are, I believe. Your life is the answer to the God question. Oh, my battery's running low. I'm not plugged in outside. i got to wrap this up. Your life is the answer to the God question. How confident are you in your answer? The Sermon on the Mount suggests you'd better make a sober assessment of yourself and your biases make you an illegitimate just judge of yourself. All the children of Lake Wobegon are above average. The church, following Bill Heibel's recent scandal, gets reminded of its insufficiencies. And I'm keeping my eyes on the sorting yourself out guy and I saw his travails and I watch him and I think, I've had how many conversations with individuals as a pastor who struggle with exactly what he struggled. The city of, the city of God is judgment day. And Jordan Peterson is Israel. He's a wrestler with God. And Jesus is Israel. And that's the point of the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is Israel. And just as Jesus, Israel, lives its cruciform life, Jesus lives the cruciform life and completes and fulfills it. What we're looking at are the boundaries of the principality. I oh, can't believe I'm running out of battery. We're looking at the boundaries of the principalities. And the city of God, it's not... Augustine will have the city of God versus the city of man. Well, what does that mean? Who is the principality? And Augustine will say, the city of God, God is the principality. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven or will enter the city of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's actions, right? Who does the will? 
Many will say to me on that day, what day? Judgment day, the day when you're at the top of the hill, the day when you are called to account, the day when you are asked to make a record of all the malevolence you are responsible for. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Yet I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. The crazy thing about Jesus in many of these stories is that it is, in fact, his association with us that is the final determiner. This gets played in, in many different ways in the Gospels, and I'm running out of battery and I can't go into it. Ah! Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, like the wise man who builds his house on the rock, the rain came down, the streams... Now, I have no idea how this video is going to turn out because I did lose power, and we'll see if... Windows adequately managed the task and I didn't lose the file, which I really hope not. I've got my mic sitting on the computer and I'm... Yeah, it's a mess. Take maximum responsibility for it. So basically, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Peter And Peugeot talks about boundaries of principalities. And when Peugeot was talking about the being of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of, of Reuben. Well, this is what I, what I wanted to, maybe I'll mention it tomorrow. The principality is in Christ. Christ is the prince. I mean, all this language connects, all this stuff ties in together. Uh, there we are. So that's the end of the video. Two hours, uh, probably way too long. Um, yeah, let me know what you think.